I'm, I'm told that the uh, is this working? Yeah. I, I'm told that the uh, that this was turned off for saving power, part of the environmental. <laughs> uh, uh, we're very honored to have Dr. Eric Singman here. At the beginning, we were talking about uh, this uh, meeting has a certain uh, English flavor with uh, Dr. Graham from London and, and Peter Rose, Canadian, and I grew up in the wilds of Australia, the Commonwealth. And Dr. Singman said, well, I grew up in the Queens. So, <laughs> so we, we maintain that royal flavor here. Uh, uh, Dr. Singman is MD, PhD at Johns Hopkins. Uh, he's director of the Wilmer, Wilms Eye Clinic there. And uh, he is so busy, and yet um, I've often referred him patients. He'll take their number, he'll call them. Uh, if he can't reach them, he'll, uh, he'll leave his cell phone number for them. Uh, he's a doctor's doctor, and uh, every patient who ever sees him thinks he's probably the finest doctor they've ever met. And so uh, uh, we're very honored to have you here, Dr. Singman. Oh, that's me. Oh. Are, are you here? Uh, no, actually, I'm, I'm in um, I'm in file. Oh. Uh, let me see. There was one. Is there the desktop? The the right? Yeah, you just. It's behind. not this one here, is no. it? This one? No, this one. Is that you? No. No, it's to the. Is that the neuro? That the That's the one there. Oh. oh. Double click it, perhaps it'll work. Oh, oh really? Okay. I'm Amish. Uh, we don't know electricity and computers. <laughs> At least that's my current excuse. Um, thank you for the introduction. I, I, I'd like to be worthy of it. I can't say I am, but it, it was really nice to hear. Um, I'm a neuro-ophthalmologist. My clinical interest, my professional interest is in automation of the ophthalmic examination, um, telemedicine, and using that to help patients with concussion and brain injury. So I'm clearly in the wrong place here talking with you. Um, but like most of us, see he knows electricity. <laughs> like, like most of us, we fell into this condition. We fell into learning about hypermotility. We fell into learning about Chiari. Um, almost accidentally uh, when a patient comes to us with something strange. Uh, I think that, and one of the audience asked a question, who do you turn to? One of the biggest problems in this con dealing with these conditions, patients with these conditions, are that doctors say, I don't want to deal with this. This is really beyond me. Um, if they're nice, they'll say that. If they're not nice, they'll say, it's all in your head, lady, because they're usually women, and they send you scattering away, running who to turn to. One, it is, at least my part of it's in the head, that's the brain, so I, I, in a sense I can get away saying that. But more importantly, um, if the doctor is willing, like Dr. Rose says, hey, I missed that finding, let me take a look if the doctor has that most important aspect of being a doctor, which is humility and caring for your patients, you can, anyone can do this. It takes some reading, it takes some phone calls, it takes some Googling, but anyone can learn about Ellis Danlis enough to be a, a quarterback for their patients. And one of the things I'd like to show you today in my brief talk is that the neuro-ophthalmology of these types of problems really are the neuro-ophthalmology of the kind of things I was dealing with anyway. A lady with Ellis Danlos, I figured it was, okay, she had Ellis Danlos, she hit her head and she came to me because she was having vision problems associated with concussion. I published on this, you can, there are articles on this, you can read about it, it was pretty much bread and butter neuro-ophthalmology of concussion. If you do that kind of thing, it's bread and butter for you. 
And she said, you know, a lot of my friends, she happened to be an Ellis Daniels support group, have these kind of problems and they didn't hit their head. And so she said, can they see you? And I said, sure, why not? And I noticed there were some very interesting common problems. The reason I have this picture, by the way, of this beautiful hand-carved eggshell, um, Beth Ann Magnuson I, is a wonderful artist out in the Midwest, and she makes these. And I asked her, can I use your picture? Because it's something that's very beautiful, but also very fragile, very delicate. And that's an Ellis Daniels patient. They are very beautiful, brilliant, wonderful people, often very highly motivated, extraordinarily high achieving, who happen to be exquisitely fragile and delicate. And that's kind of what causes their problems. Number one on my hit list is Chiari. Uh, in fact, the patient who came to me had Chiari. And this is something that we diagnosed. Um, Chiari can be there for a very long time and be subclinical. Patients do not know they have it. Then they get whacked on the head and they start developing Chiari symptoms. And then they get an MRI and the MRI is routinely read as normal. But what's interesting about the MRI is that they don't specifically mention the descent of the cerebellar tonsils. So you go back to the neuroradiologist and say, Miles or David, can you please take a look at the tonsils and specifically tell me about them? And the response is usually, oh, they're only three or four millimeters descendant. That's kind of borderline. Okay, some people, you would have been nice to know that. Or they say, oh, I missed it. They're six or seven millimeters descendant. Thanks for picking that up. Either way, though, they get Chiari. And Chiari does a lot of things to patients. Um, one, it can give them nystagmus. Now, I actually created that myself. And so that is my own. Um, I, I, I put the little black dots on Homer Simpson. So he's my personal hero. I modeled my life after him in many ways. Um, I drool, I snore, I get. Um, so, but nystagmus is a problem these patients can get. If It can often be very subtle. Um, another problem they can get with Chiari is they get a problem that neuro-ophthalmologists see a lot. They get elevated intracranial pressure. And this has been called the Chiari pseudotumor cerebri complex. The problem with that is you have kind of a chicken and egg issue here. Uh, studies done on patients with run-of-the-mill pseudotumor cerebri who are the classic patients you expect to see. They have uh, woman, childbearing age, elevated body mass. They come in with papilledema. They come in with headaches and they have, maybe have some sleep apnea, and they come in with massive papilledema, you do a spinal tap, the pressure is 45, and they have venous sinus stenosis, and all the things you'd like to know about. And you, do, look at their you look at their brain, and the cerebellar tonsils are low. So studies have shown, including one very interesting ARVO study from a few years ago, that when you did the spinal tap and relieve the pressure, the tonsils ascend. One study has as much as eight millimeters of ascension after lowering the pressure. So now we're stuck with which came first, the Chiari, the pseudotumor, both. I don't know if I really care in the sense that these patients got to be treated, and I worry about them going blind because that kind of level of papilledema chronically will cause blindness and acutely can cause an ischemic optic neuropathy, and they can go blind. Either way, though, they'll lose feel and lose visual acuity if you don't do something. But the bottom line is with these patients is that that's something I get to see with them, not infrequently. And which is why when you have a patient with pseudotumor cerebri or elevated intracranial pressure for whatever reason, please, please, please make sure you look at the cerebellar tonsils. You might be surprised what you find. Um, they also can have uh, esotropia. They can come in from elevated brain pressure with bilateral six or unilateral six in their palsies. It's just something I see. But something else they often get, and we'll get to this soon, is they also they have other kind of oculomotor abnormalities. And whether these abnormalities are due directly to brainstem impingement, and we saw with Dr. Kobe's talk why that can happen, or it's due to autonomic dysfunction, I really don't know, and I'm not really sure it's known. One of the problems is a traumatic brain injury doctor 
is that patients MRIs and CAT scans look really pretty good. Now, sometimes they really don't look so good. You have to go to someone who knows what they're looking at to look again. But sometimes they do look very good and sometimes you have to use things as subtle as diffusion tensor imaging to really get an idea of, after brain injury at least, what's going on. But these patients, we don't know. Um, another problem they get and they come to me for is they come to me with eye pain and they come to me with headache and they've gone and had MRIs and CAT scans and seen other ophthalmologists and they say it hurts right here and it really hurts all the time and so I do what David Knox who's at Hopkins who described this in the 70s do is I press on the back of their neck around the greater occipital nerve and then they jump out of the chair I call that Knox's sign when they hit the ceiling and that means they probably have a greater occipital neuralgia or a cervicogenic headache. And this is something that I see a lot in brain injury patients. And the reason I see it is because when someone gets whacked in the head, we have to remember that the next job is to bend and extend, not to compress. The neck really doesn't like that. And the supraspinalis muscles are right over that greater occipital nerve. It gets a, it's a very tight place. At any rate, I see this a lot. We, Chiari patients who have Ellis Danlos. I'm assuming it's because of the fact that patients with Ellis Danlos have squishy, not such great collagen that's supporting the ligaments in their neck and things get compressed, I assume. I don't know that for sure, but again, this kind of picture, if I would have had, that's why I put in the corner there, right there, traumatic, traumatic brain injury. If I, if I were giving a talk on traumatic brain injury, I'd have the same pictures and the same slides. And that overlap is remarkable to me. And that overlap is something that if you were to read some of the literature on traumatic brain injury and concussion and visual problems thereafter, you'd say this is, this is a little more than incidental. Another problem that I have to deal with um, with these patients is that their blood vessels break. And when they break, they often can hurt parts of the body that affect vision. And so obviously, this is a little bit of common sense, but as a neuro-ophthalmologist, I have to deal with this all the time. If someone gets an arterial dissection, um, for example, if they get an arterial dissection, let's say the carotid, and the sympathetic chain runs right up in that, they're going to get a Horner syndrome. They're also going to have a lot of pain. That, that used to be called Rader syndrome, but they get a Horner syndrome with a droopy eyelid and a small pupil. Um, this is an autonomic problem, but unlike some of the autonomic problems that disorder only is that you've seen in these Ellis Daniels patients, this problem can be traced directly to damage, either ischemic damage or compressive damage to the sympathetic chain. But again, these patients will come into me, um, especially if they have a headache, they might go to the emergency room, but I usually get them in faster. Um, and they come and they say, you know, I, my mom noticed my pupil was smaller or I noticed I'm having trouble reading because they, they, uh, they have actually increased accommodation than I, and they, or they notice a droopy eyelid. If they have a stroke or a dissection and it hits part of the afferent visual pathways, they can get a field cut. And we see these pretty frequently. Remember that the vertebral basal circulation feeds the occipital cortex, and so they can get a homonymous field cut. And that's something that, again, that's, that usually is pretty obvious. But you know what's funny how many times you see patients come in with a field cut, and the report is more like their family member says they're bumping into things, or maybe they had a little car accident or fender bender or something. And, and they, this should actually be picked up. People can actually get around with a field cut and not know it as well as you'd think. you think it'd be an obvious thing, but it's, it actually can be pretty subtle. Another problem they can get is they can have the carotid artery have a problem inside the cavernous sinus. And when that happens, all of a sudden now you have a CC fistula. Um, that increases, they, again, they'll, patients have come to me directly uh, because they've come with a very red eye. The eye has a hemorrhagic chemosis where it's also, the, the tissues are all boggy and swollen. Um, if it's bad enough, they're going to get reduced um, neural function. The pupil might not work right or the vision might be down or they may not be able to look up or down, left or right. But either way, they're going to have something that shows as an orbital process here. And Again, these kind of things can be seen after head injury. We've seen after, you know, all these whiplash injury, um, severe head injury to the occiput. Um, but again, in Ehlers-Danlos and diseases where they have weak connective tissue, you can get these kind of problems and these things show up pretty commonly. 
One of the things I mentioned up there also was, I mentioned stroke and migraine. Migraine is really important to think about because Ehlers-Danlos patients have an incredibly higher risk of having migraine. And migraine patients often will come to me because migraine patients often will complain of something like they saw flashing lights or dazzling lights and their mom told them it might be a retinal attachment or so they might come to me and make sure it's not a retinal attachment. And when you take a careful history, you'll see it wasn't vitreo retinal traction, but in fact it was indeed a migraine. And migraine patients can also get dysautonomias. So I've had migraine patients come into me with a Horner syndrome. So when someone comes in with a migraine of Horner's, even though I think it might be a migraine of Horner's, it's still my job to make sure they don't have an arterial dissection. But there was an overlap. Um, I always wondered why the Ellis Daniels patients had more migraine. My patients report it frequently. It's been reported in the literature, it's more common. There are some reports that migraine has a higher incidence in patients who have things like mitral valve prolapse and patent ductus arteriosus. Things that, you know, and, and certainly um, Ellis Daniels patients have more mitral valve prolapse. Whether or not those two things are connected, I don't know. I mean, I'd be interested to see a study, I haven't seen it yet of someone doing um, some sort of database research, seeing whether or not the mitral valve prolapse and migraines go together more in those dentals and how that's connected. In terms of higher order defects, again, my patients will come to me with Ellis Danlos and my patients will come to me with concussion and they'll say things like, I am dumber. And I know it's quite odd to say because, you know, how does someone know they're dumber? You have, well, you know you're dumber when you started out really bright and then you feel like you're searching for words and you can't pay attention as well and you're reading, you can't keep your eye on the line on the page. You feel a little bit ADHD-ish, you feel, you feel dumber and, and it's an, a remarkable thing. So they'll tell you things like, I used to be able to read an hour and two hours of study. I can't read five minutes. I get a headache, I get bored, I get a dizziness. And, and we find that there are a lot of things they get. Here's a picture of, uh, I, we have a lot of people here who are from England or from the Commonwealth, so I wanted to have a picture here of Her Majesty the Queen. Um, and she also is showing that eye-hand coordination is very important and that patients with concussion and Ellis Daniels, they have unusual problems with eye-hand coordination. Another thing they have, and that's why I wanted to show this picture, is there is a entity called visual midline shift syndrome. It's, it's not really sure whether it's a real nosologic entity yet. It's being studied. But patients, when you ask them to take some vertical object and you say, bring it right in front of you till it cleaves you in half, and they'll bring it to like here or they'll bring it to like here, as if they've lost their ego center, as if they've lost what their visual midline is, that's something we see in concussion patients. So I've started looking at some of my Ellis Daniels patients who especially the ones who say that they've gotten klutzier. They've got, they've, they've, and, and sure enough, a couple of them actually show evidence of that. Now, um, more research that's shown that, that may be a real nosologic entity is that they have these patients who have this midline shift walk on pressure-sensitive treadmills, and it shows that they're actually shifting their weight. And when we give them yoked prisms so that we move their vision back to center, so to speak, they start walking more normally. It's pretty impressive to see that change. Um, we, uh, we came this close to a DOD grant for that last year, but uh, we didn't quite make that. Um, another problem is that, as I said, these patients get a lot of different visual impairments with respect to reading. They have problems with convergence. Convergence means you bring your eyes together when you read, and you have to be able to do that. Ellis Danlos patients, and I've started looking at a database because one of my residents has a PhD in Marfan's, and he's been collecting the patients with me. And I, he says, there are a lot of patients with this. I said, yeah. And what happens is they get very tired when they read. They can't go like this and maintain convergence for a reasonable period of time to be able to do work in studying. Now that's fixable with simple exercises, believe it or not. But it's a real problem and patients are not, it, it, you'd be surprised how many ophthalmologists don't pick that up because it's very simple to miss and most ophthalmologists don't look for it. They look for something like something in the eyeball itself. Optometrists are actually a little more aware of picking this kind of thing up and, and offering therapy for it. Same thing with pursuit. You take a patient, you take something simple like a pendulum and you have it go back and forth and some of these patients will look at it and go like this or say, please don't do that, it makes me nauseous or uncomfortable. And they have a clear deficiency of pursuits. Even though their pursuits can be smooth, they still can follow well. They feel very uncomfortable trying to follow well. Um, the reason I put that portion of the slide up is because 
there are times you really have to advocate for your patients. And part of that advocate, being an advocate means I have some patients who have 20, 20 vision, normal visual fields, and I have them in individual educational programs, IEPs, that's what we call at least in Pennsylvania, Maryland, where they are treated as patients who functionally are blind. I said, treat them, they're not going to go better in school until I say so. Treat them with auditory learning, treat them with auditory text, let the students progress and not fall back. We'll work on the vision, you work on the learning. And we've actually had to do that for a couple of our students because we have that much pushback to, well, they can see, they must be able to, and the doctor says their eye exam is fine, they're 20 so it must be, they're crazy, they're a problem, it's in their head. No, it's not. And sometimes I said you have to advocate your patients like that. Um, again, my hero. Um, patients, as I said, they, they, these patients, uh, as you heard Dr. Graham mention, um, they get obese and they get unmotivated and they get fatigued with doing any kind of effort and they can end up as bad as, as this picture suggests they can. Um, I have a slide too that says it takes a village, just like Dr. Graham had one, although unlike Dr. Graham's slide, I have ophthalmology on here. Um, and hopefully maybe I'll make it onto his slide in the next um, uh, inception therein. I think. <laughs> but it, it, I could, I, it, I almost want to take the slide out or skip over it, but I think it's better to actually reemphasize it does take a village. There's no one doctor I know who can do all of this, but there is one doctor who can try. If that patient has a family doctor who cares about the patient, who's willing to listen, who is willing to accept that sometimes the patient might know more than the doctor, as Dr. Graham suggested, and is willing to be the quarterback and, and advocate for that patient, this can work, because that doctor can then be a guide to the different members of this village. Um, and obviously, as, as everyone has here said, even though we've all fallen into this, uh, organizations like the CSF and the QR malformation and, and Ellis Danlos, and that's why they have the zebra, because it is like a zebra of disease. That, with the research and awareness and network, and this is how you make things better. Thank you so much. What do you do about that feeling of, I'm getting up, or I feel up, or how do you treat those? Back to the village. Okay, let me just repeat anyone who's got a question. The question is, what do you do when the patient feels dumber? And again, I always go right back to that village slide. First, you've got to find out why. If the patient, and you take a very careful history, if the patient says, I'm not reading as well, or I'm reading more slowly, then you look at some of the vision problems associated with, and I, I used to term concussion, that's what I was trained in, but in fact, with all these analysts I see frequently, you look at some of those neurobehavioral vision problems, and you see which one of those you can deal with, which one of those you can treat. But you also will often deal with and uh, work with the neuropsychologists who work with TBI, like there's a, a, a professor, Kathleen Court, uh, at, at Hopkins, and she works with um, patients who've had TBI, concussion patients, and we work together all the time. I will send patients to her because she'll find that these patients have symptoms and, and findings that make a positive for post-traumatic stress, for depression, for other problems that our company, as Dr. Graham said, other problems that accompany the syndrome, and you have to work in it together. Um, and it's not just a matter of giving antidepressants, but it's also a matter of making the patient aware of things so they can build their own bag of tricks to deal with. Okay, I can't read for more than 10 minutes anymore. I'm now going to only study in five minute blocks or I'm going to use auditory learning books on tape because I can't listen words, I can't read, and you have to teach them the tricks you need to do because they're not dumber. They just have to learn differently. Now, some of them actually may actually be dumber. Some of them actually have actually, you know, we, I had one patient who did, she happened to have an IQ test for some reason a few years before she had another one. It was down. And the doctor, the neuropsychologist who admits it, yeah, she's missing in some of these areas. And you can't screw around with the brain without causing some trouble, and that may be part of it. So there may have to be a new baseline you accept also. <laughs>